message today. Today is week six on our series of the supernatural power of a transformed mind. A very, if you've missed any of this, uh, it's all on our YouTube uh, media page. Just go back and watch. Um, but I would really encourage you to, to recap uh, lesson number one. And uh, if, if you remember in lesson number one, it was the first time that Jesus multiplied food. Uh, they, they, they were out in an area where there weren't a lot of uh, HEBs. You know, it was kind of like DFW. Yeah, they were building them, but there weren't any at the time. So everybody was hungry. And um, uh, the disciples saw a crowd of 5,000 men. And you have to imagine that um, you know, most of those men were probably married, and there was no birth control, so they probably had lots and lots of babies. So you're looking at 5,000 men plus women and children. It could have been a crowd of 20, 25,000 people. And the disciples are looking at the crowd, and they're like, oh, man, we are in trouble because we got all these hungry people and no food. Because they were thinking with unrenewed, untransformed minds, and all they could see was a problem with no way to fix that problem. But in Jesus' mind, Jesus' mind was fixed on the Father. Jesus' mind was renewed by heaven. Jesus' mind was transformed by the power of God. So he saw 20,000 people, but then he saw five loaves of bread and two fish, and he's like, no problem. We'll just multiply this food. It makes perfect sense. Because to the transformed mind, a miracle is possible. So he, you know, blessed the food, he broke it, he put it in the hands of the disciples, and then the disciples are the ones who put it in baskets and walked around the crowd and just kept breaking off more bread and fish, and everybody was fed until there was food left over. So that was when Jesus fed the 5,000. Fast forward, we don't know exactly how much time has transpired, but it had to have been less than three years. So fast forward, we have the same situation, but this time there's 4,000 men plus women and children, Mark chapter 8, verse 1. I'm going to read fairly quickly. About this time, another large crowd gathered. The people ran out of food. Jesus called the disciples and said, hey, I mean, I feel sorry for these people. They've been here with me for three days, and they haven't had anything to eat. If we send them home now hungry, they're going to faint along the way, for some of them have traveled for a long distance. Now, just leave that slide up there for a second, fellas. Uh, females, sorry, ladies. Uh, I don't want to say fellas when I know his ladies back there on the media today. I don't know that this would fly today in 2022, that Christians that want to follow Jesus would travel long distance by foot in the desert without food, go hungry, just because they were so hungry for more of Jesus' teaching. Like, I don't know that that would fly today. Today, we pick a church based on how close it is to our house, how good the air conditioning is, how comfortable the seats are, how much they're going to give me and offer me and my family. The, what we've created today is not what we see in these verses where the people were so hungry to be taught by Jesus and to learn more about Jesus that they walked in the desert in the Middle East so far that Jesus said, if we send them home hungry, they're going to faint on the way. The situation is dire. By the way, if you are visiting with us and you wonder why our church looks half brand new and half apocalyptic, we are in the middle of a remodel. We're just two or three weeks away from being done. We've already bought brand new carpet. We've already bought brand new chairs. We're just waiting for a couple of more things in the ceiling to get done, and then it's going to look all beautiful and clean and pretty. Thank you for your patience. So ready for this to be over. Woo. Verse 4, the disciples replied, Jesus. How are we supposed to find enough food to feed all these people out here in the wilderness? Jesus said, well, how much bread do you have? And they replied, we got seven loaves of bread. Now, you have to understand, this is probably like a face palm moment, that Jesus was like, bro, did, did, were you not there for the 5,000 when food was multiplying in your hand to feed 5,000 people? And, and you're telling me we have no way to feed 4,000 people? Because they were thinking with their unrenewed minds. Now, this did bother Jesus. He doesn't address it in the moment, but I'll read it to you. He addresses it later because he, he was pretty disgusted with the disciples for thinking with a carnal human mind when they've already been exposed to what miracles God could do. Verse 6, Jesus told the people to sit on the ground. He took those seven loaves of bread. He thanked God for them. He broke them into pieces. He gave them to the disciples, and the disciples are the ones who distributed those to the crowd. They also found a few small fish. So, the disciple, so Jesus blessed those and told the disciples to distribute the fish as well. They ate as much as they wanted, and afterward, the disciples picked up seven large baskets of leftover food. There were about 4,000 men in the crowd that day. Jesus sent them home with full bellies after they had eaten. Now, immediately after this, follow the story, immediately after this, he got into a boat, went with his disciples, he crossed over to the region of Dalmunatha. Skip down to verse 14. 
the disciples were in a boat and they had forgotten to bring food. <laughs> they had seven basketfuls of leftover food, but they forgot and they just had one little loaf of bread with them in the boat. As they're crossing the lake, Jesus warned them, hey boys, watch out. Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. And you know that these are, most of them were fishermen. These are guys that know how to sail. They're hoisting the main sail and putting out the jib and doing something with the force. I don't know, I'm making stuff up right now that I've heard from movies. And they're like, what's he talking about? Something about the yeast of Herod and the Pharisees. Cool, Jesus is talking crazy talk again. Can I just let you in on a little secret and we won't have time to go into it because it's a whole other sermon. Jesus was saying you have to be careful of the yeast that'll spread in your faith of empty religion, Pharisees, and empty politics. Now I know that you guys aren't concerned with politics and empty politics uh, and empty religion, but that was Jesus' warning to his own disciples. Let's keep reading the story, verse 16. As they began to argue with each other because they hadn't brought any bread, Jesus knew what they were saying and he said, hey, why are you arguing about not having any bread? And then listen to these questions that Jesus asks. Do you know or understand even yet what he's saying is, after all this time, do you guys even have a clue about the kingdom of God? Are your hearts so hard you can't take it in? And look at verse 18, he punches them in the mouth. Yeah, your eyes have seen, but you can't see. You have ears, but you can't hear. And listen to this, this is what we're going to talk about today. Don't you remember anything at all. If you've got a paper Bible, which I strongly encourage you to do, I'd like you to circle, highlight, underline, get that tattooed in Greek on your arm. Do you remember anything at all? If you have a digital Bible, highlight it digitally, and then six months from now when you're scrolling back, you have no idea why you did that. Verse 19, Jesus said, guys, remember when I fed the 5,000 with five loaves of bread, how many baskets of leftovers did y'all pick up afterwards? Uh, 12, right. When I fed the 4,000, Today, with the seven loaves of bread, how many large baskets of leftovers did y'all pick up? Seven. He's going, don't you guys get it? Don't you understand? Guys, put first 18 back up. He said, you have eyes, but you're not seeing anything. Don't you remember anything at all? The disciples went back to thinking with unrenewed minds, untransformed minds. They had seen Jesus do miracles, so you would assume that they would remember what Jesus did and then expect him to do another miracle. No, no, their minds went back to their human, carnal, fearful way of thinking. And Jesus is like, dude, y'all have to remember. So he says, you remember what I did, you'll be expecting me to do it again. And here's my point. If we don't intentionally remember what God has done, our minds will automatically revert to limit what God can do in the future. And I remind you, Jesus was not talking to unbelievers. Jesus was talking to the 12 disciples. He was talking to the 12 people that had the highest Jesus education on earth. All of the disciples could have had a PhD, the doctor of Jesus, but yet they still had not remembered what Jesus had done for them. He's not talking to unchurched people, he's talking to church people. He understands that even for Jesus followers, even when we see God do amazing things in church, even when we see God do amazing things and we hear these stories, it's so easy to get sucked back in to the yeast of Pharaoh and Herod. And what we do is we turn our churches into groups of people that create a rule of religion without a relationship. And the church gets caught up and worrying about and thinking about politics that are powerless and do not matter in the kingdom of God. And if we will not remember and put the miracles that God has done before us, we create a form of godliness but deny the power of God. That, that, that verse is actually something that the apostle Paul, he, he wrote, he said it to Timothy. Timothy, he, he was writing to a church. He said, Tim, I want you to mark this. There's going to be times in the last days, and he's talking to church, church people will be lovers of themselves, they'll be lovers of money, they'll be boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. They'll have a form of godliness, but they'll deny its power. The Apostle Paul said, have nothing to do with people like that. 
Remember, the whole point of this message is talking about remembering what God did. If we're going to believe God for his power tomorrow, we have to remember what God did yesterday. And Paul was warning, this can happen to the end time church. We just read that it happened to the disciples. In the Old Testament, it happened to the people of Israel over and over and over again. They did not remember the power of God. In fact, we see this weird pattern happen with the ancient people of Israel over and over. They would love God and they would serve God and then something would happen and then they would get disillusioned and then their hearts would get hard and then they would be disobey God and then they would spiral down and then their belly button and then why is there all this terrible thing? Woe is me. And then somebody's like, hey, remember that time God did that great thing? And then they repent before God, and then they love God, and then they return to God, and then time goes by, and then they get disobedient, and then they wonder why their lives are in a wreck. It's because they forgot what God did. So to avoid all of this heartache of spiraling their lives out of control, Moses, he warned the people, he's like, listen, I'm going to give you guys some, it's going to be Ten Commandments. They're still going to be talking about these 4,000 years from now. But then I'm also going to give you in Deuteronomy a bunch of cultural laws. God cares about what you do for a living. God cares about how you tie your, well, not literally how you tie your shoes. God wanted to be involved in every little nook and cranny of people's lives. So he was was warning them, listen, I'm going to give you all of these great laws and rules from God. But in Deuteronomy chapter 4, he says, I want you to watch out. Be careful to, listen guys, be careful to never forget what you have seen. Do not, golly, if you ever wanted to get a big Hebrew tattoo across your back, do not let these memories escape your mind as long as you live. Just leave that verse up there for a minute. Do not let these memories of the miracles that God did in your life escape your mind as long as you live. And now listen to how it gets really important, not for today, but for tomorrow. Be sure to pass these memories on to your children and grandchildren. Never forget the day when you stood before the Lord God on Mount Sinai and all the miracles that God did. Never let the miracles of God escape your minds and then teach them to the next generation. Because if we don't teach the next generation how to have an encounter with the power and presence of God, there won't be a next generation of Jesus followers. So you have to learn to study the Word of God. You have to cultivate a lifestyle of prayer and worship. And in your home, you should be praying for sick people and laying your hands on your kids when they're sick. You should be prophesying and giving words of knowledge over your children. Having a supernatural lifestyle should be normal in your home. As normal as it is for your kids to learn math and science and history at school, it's like, well, when I go home, my parents are going to teach me the kingdom of God. Why? Because you're raising them up for the next generation. It's so important because if we don't teach them this, the church will die. We've got to teach them how to love Jesus. And parents, don't expect your kids to love God more than you. You have to set the standard. You have to be the example. You don't have to be weird about it. You don't have to be a helicopter controlling, manipulative parent. You just have to desperately love Jesus and your kids are going to follow. All right, why is this transformed mind so important? Why would we take six weeks and talk about it over and over and over again from so many different perspectives? Here's why. Because if we're not careful to be sure that our minds are renewed by God, that we would have our minds transformed by God, it is so easy to slip back into normal, human, carnal thinking, faithless thinking. It, it, happens, so, it, it happens so quickly. Because the unrenewed mind will put God in a box and say, I don't remember what God did, but I know that God can't do anything outside of this box. The renewed mind will remember what God did and say, you know what, if God did it then, I'll bet he could do it again. Let's believe God for a miracle in our lives. And if we don't live a lifestyle like that, we create a religion of rules. We create a religion that's just all discipline and no passion. Don't get me wrong. There needs to be discipline in our Christian life. The word disciple means a disciplined follower. Yes, we need disciplines. I'm not saying we throw discipline out the window, but I'm just saying the Christian life should be known more than just the disciplines that we keep. It should be known for our passion and our intimacy and our encounters with a living God. And what's happening is we're testifying about what God has done, what God is doing, and what we're believing God to do in our lives. 
And that testimony is so important. So many Christians live their entire lives and never testify about what God has done in their life. Revelation chapter 19 says, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. What does that mean? Just think about that. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It means if we will testify about what Jesus has done, we will prophesy about what God wants to do in our lives. And we have to be intentional about this. We have to like do three specific things, and I'm going to give them to you here in a moment. Because don't forget, from Deuteronomy, there's there's, there's verses in Joshua, there's verses in Joel. It's all throughout the Old Testament. And Jesus himself in the boat with the disciples saying, dude, Don't you remember? We have to be intentional about remembering what God did. I'm going to read to you a long portion of Scripture. I'll read it again quickly just because I love it. It's a a long story, but I'll keep it fairly short. For some of you, you've heard it a thousand times. For some of you that are new to Jesus stuff, you're going to hear it for the first time. Long story short, the people of Israel, the Jewish people, were in slavery in Egypt. And God said, listen, this is time for you guys to go up into the land of Israel, your promised land. So they, they went into the desert there, kind of the Mount Sinai, Saudi Arabia type south of Israel area. And for 40 years, they were working their way up towards the nation of Israel, up towards the Jordan River that separates today modern day Jordan from modern day Israel. And they're right there at that river. Now, during the dry season in the Middle East, that river can get down to like eight, ten feet, and it just kind of slowly meanders. If you needed to, you could cross it. And if you had a a horse or an animal that could swim, you could cross the Jordan River. But what you're going to read about, by the time Joshua got the people of Israel to the Jordan River, a little bit of a problem, it was the rainy season. And the banks of the Jordan River were overflowing. Now, I have actually been in Israel during the rainy season, and not only does the river come up many, many, many feet, it is no longer a meandering river. It is a white water river that if you put your foot in there, you'll get washed away downstream. And Joshua took two million people to the bank of the Jordan River, and they were like, whoops, there's the promised land just a hundred yards away, but I can't get there. So the situation was impossible. If only anybody had a memory of what God did at the Red Sea, hello. Joshua chapter three and verse 14, the people left the camp in the morning, they crossed the Jordan River. The priests were carrying the Ark of the Covenant of God. They were carrying the literal presence of God manifest on the earth. It was harvest season and the Jordan River was overflowing its banks. But as soon as the feet of the priests who were carrying the ark touched the water at the river's edge, the water above that point began to back up a great distance away near a town called Adam, which was near Zarethan. And the water below that point then flowed down into the Dead Sea. Wait for it, the riverbed became dry. Not muddy, no, no, dry. Because you drain a river, it's going to be muddy for a month or two, right? Dry. Meanwhile, the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Lord's Covenant stood on dry ground in the middle of the riverbed as the people passed by. They waited there until the entire nation of Israel crossed over the Jordan River on dry ground. That's the end of chapter 3, but just turn the page. The very next verse is Joshua chapter 4 and verse 1. All the people crossed the Jordan River. The Lord said to Joshua, hey, Josh, take... Take 12 men, one from each one of the tribes of Israel, and tell them to go in and take 12 stones from the very place where the priests were standing in the middle of the Jordan River, and then carry them out and then place them where you guys are going to camp tonight. Skip down to verse 6. We're going to use these stones to build a memorial so that in the future, listen to the next generation, in the future, your children are going to say, hey, Dad, what are these stones for? And you're going to tell your kids, well, these stones remind us that the Jordan River stopped and the Ark of the Lord crossed right at this point. It'll be a memorial. It'll be a remembrance in the nation of Israel forever. So 100, 120 years later, there's a, you know, a, a dad and a son, and they're out walking along the Jordan, and then they see the big pile of rocks, and the kid goes, Dad, what's the pile of rocks for? He goes, boy, let me tell you, your great-grandfather was a part of the nation of Israel that crossed the Jordan River on dry land right at this point, and the father is reminding the son of what God did. Parents, we owe it to our children and our grandchildren, and here's your first point, to write down everything that God has done in your life. 
how you got born again, how you got reborn again if you ran from God and came back. Every miracle that God has done in your life, every prophetic word that has been spoken over your life, write it down in a journal and date it every time God did something amazing. And then I want you to take it out from time to time and remind yourself what God did because he'll do it again. And if you've got a loved one, a friend, somebody at church, somebody in your small group, and they're like, God did this amazing miracle in my life, just grab a hold of that and say, well, if God did it for them, he can do it for me and mark it and date it. So that next time you need a miracle in that same area, you're going to claim the promise that was given to somebody else because God doesn't love that person more than he loves you. So if he did it for them, he's going to do it for you. And then you're going to teach your children and your grandchildren what God has done. You're creating a legacy. I don't care if you're a multimillionaire and you give tons of money to your kids. That's just going to burn. You give something that really matters and that is fruit that remains the future of the church, the kingdom of God handed down from generation to generation. In fact, Jesus said, if he is the the vine and we're the grapes, if we would remain connected to him, we will produce fruit that remains. So you might be putting all of your time and all of your energy and all of your effort into winning at work. Or maybe you're a great, you've got a great hobby. You love to, to dance or you love to craft or you love to fish or hunt or whatever your hobby is and you're amazing at it. Or maybe you're trying to win at, at your bank account and keep adding zeros to your bank account. Listen to me. If you lose at home, you lose at life. So we have to transform our minds, renew our minds to always be remembering what God has done. We can't think with a, an unrenewed carnal mind because that says, God can't do a miracle in this situation in my life. Now, I don't know about who you are. Some of you are more um, feelers. You're more emotional. You're more moved with your heart. I'm not. I'm not super intellectual. Like, I don't have, like, the intelligence that's going to, like, rival any doctors or lawyers in our church. But I kind of pride myself on being practically mindset. I I have kind of a lot of street smarts. Street smarts with Detective J.J. Bittenbinder. That was a joke for a very small number of people. So for the few people that got the joke, I needed a little more laughter. (laughs) It is so easy to revert back to our natural, human, practical intellect. And we want to rationalize everything and we want to reason everything. But we have to remember, I am only temporarily visiting this world. I'm not a part of this world. I am a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. So my first thought, my first response should be what would the kingdom of heaven like to do in this situation? Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's here. It's now. The Holy Spirit said, I'm going to put the kingdom within you. So I, when, I, when I preach and I have to read my teleprompter, I always wear my glasses because everything's fuzzy. But then when I put them on, everything becomes clear. We need to realize that the kingdom of God needs to be the lenses through which we see life. Because if we only look with our natural eyes, there's going to be nothing for God to do in our life. But if we think, well, if God did it before, he could do it again, we're going to be thinking and our faith is going to be built up. Now, I'm not saying we turn our brains off and we're just mindless, stupid robots. I know that the church gets a lot of criticism for just being stupid. Revelation chapter 1 says that we are kings and priests, that we are both in this world, but we're natural, but we're full of the Holy Spirit. We have to be careful to not go into one ditch or the other where we're all intellect or we're all just, you know, emotional, weird Holy Spirit. There is a balance, but the balance has to be based on the fact that nothing is impossible for God. The balance has to be based on the fact that the kingdom of God is superior to the kingdom of this world. Because if not, we will always fall back on our carnal, just like the disciples, our carnal human intellect. But Proverbs chapter 3 says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not lean on knowledge him and then the Lord will make your path straight. It's so easy to lean on our own understanding. It's so easy that we get laid off at work or somebody breaks our heart or somebody betrays us or we get a diagnosis from a doctor that we don't understand and it could hurt, it could even end in death. And then we begin to rationally try to figure out how we're going to get ourselves out of this situation. Listen, we need to remember what God has done in the past. He would like to do it again in our lives. We always face things with a human perspective. I need you to renew, transform your mind to think from a kingdom perspective. Lean not on your own understanding. All right, so the first thing was to write it down, remember it. The next thing is I need you to get better at testifying. 
telling people what God has done in your life. So many Christians can live their whole life and never really testify, never really say what God has done. But the testimony that you have is so important. A testimony should be heard by other people. It should be spoken by you. It should be written down. It should be remembered. It should be reviewed. A testimony should be reviewed again and again and again. The the word review is so simple. It means re, go back, view, to see. Go back and see what God did in your life before. Go back and see it and then just believe God to do it again. Share your story. That's what testimony means. If you go to court and testify, you're simply sharing your story. So you get up and say, well, here's what I saw. Here's what God did. Here's the pain that I felt and we prayed and then it went away. Here was the situation in relationship. Here was the situation financial and God did this thing. That's my story. Don't make it up. Don't add stuff to it. But it's going to help people lift their eyes and perspective off of this world's problems and put them on heaven. I'm telling you, your story might be the key to unlock somebody else's prison. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So your testimony will prophesy to somebody that God wants to move. If he did it for them, he could do it for me. And a testimony will reveal the heart of God. If you listen to testimonies, you'll realize maybe you didn't know that God likes to heal arthritis. Maybe you didn't know that God likes to help find jobs for people. Maybe you didn't know that God likes to help put spouses together. Maybe you didn't know that God likes to heal wombs and and bring babies or, or, or put an adoption together. By the way, we need more people to sign up for adoption. I could have used a bigger amen right there. Third and final thing to remember. The Bible, the Word of God, is 66 books of testifying what God did for other people so he could do it again in your life. Too often we read the Bible like a history book. I'm telling you, we need to read the Bible like a playbook and say, well, if God did it for the people back then, I know he could do it in my life. See, testifying is not meant to be hard, but we make it so difficult. Hop up on your feet. I'm going to help you. I'm going to give you an example. Reading your Bible, and you might think, I don't know, Jesus healed the sick, raised the dead, cast out devils, walked on water, multiplied food. Yeah. If he did it then, he could do it again. Like, well, he was Jesus. No, he was God, but he was here as a human, full of the Spirit of God. You're a human, full of the Spirit of God. Jesus said, everything that I did, you can do. And then Jesus corrected himself and said, nah, fam, if I did it, you could do greater things. Well, I've never heard of anybody walk on water. I have. I know a missionary that is preaching the gospel, and there were guerrilla warriors that were coming to kill him, and he got on his motorcycle, and he got to the edge of a raging river, and they were coming, and bullets were whizzing by, so he just revved the engine, and he ran that motorcycle right across that raging river and was like, cool. I know a youth pastor. I don't, I, 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 I don't even know that God loves uh, unkosher food. But I know a youth pastor in Louisiana that was having a, um, what are those, you people eat gross things. Crawfish, thank you. No. I'm, I don't don't eat gross things. You people eat gross things. The youth group was holding a huge crawfish boil. And like, he was, I forget the numbers. He was expecting like 100 people to come and everybody was going to throw in, you know, five or 10 bucks. It was going to help the youth group raise money to take a mission trip somewhere. And like 300 people showed up for this guy's crawfish boil. So he went back and he saw the bags and he saw the boiler and the steamer and he saw the people and he's like, I don't know what to do. He was like literally 20, 21 years old. And he went back and he said, I laid my, I know this kid. He went back and he said, I laid my hands on the bags of crawfish and I said, Lord, as these go into the water, I pray you'd multiply them. And I won't look, I won't count until everybody's done. And then I think it was his mom or somebody that was helping. Actually, let's be honest, it was probably his dad, right? His dad do the crawfish boil. Isn't that is kind of an arrogant, it's like, it's like real men with grills. So the dad was scooping the, the things and they'd wait and they'd season and then the kid would come and he just kept kind of winking and smiling and he'd put the crawfish out and then he'd go back out and he'd take another one. He'd take another one. Long story short, all three, this was just a couple years ago, all 300 people ate and then he went back. He's like, is there any more? He's like, yeah, the pot's still full. That was in Louisiana like, like eight years ago. If God did it then, he can do it again. I've told you the story when when I was a teenager and I prayed for a guy who was totally blind and I watched blind eyes open. I've told you the story of a a woman that had uh, under the blip, blip, and we prayed and she came back to life and lived another 10 years. I got an email that Marlena had a hand thing 
and they prayed two weeks ago, and she really believed that God touched her hand, and Marlena, was your hand healed? And is it still healed today? It's not healed today, so it's gonna be healed today. Oh, I'm glad I asked that question. I ain't, I ain't scared of that. Oh no, it didn't stay healed. I ain't scared, because God healed it two weeks ago, he'll heal it again today, amen? All right, let's just, let's just play a little game. Just gonna raise your hand, put it down, raise your hand, put it down. If and do not lie, you lie in church, bad things happen. Read Ananias and Sapphira. If you have, with your eyeballs, seen or experienced a real honest to goodness healing miracle, raise your hand. All right, put your hand down. Why did I do that? Because there's people in this room this morning that need a healing miracle in their body. And by seeing a couple hundred hands go up, they're like, whew. God did it for them, he could do it for me. Let's move on. Remember uh, two months ago when Jerry got baptized and Jerry's been a lifelong addict? And I asked all of you that have overcome addiction to surround Jerry in the baptistry that day. And I was stunned by the number of people that surrounded him. And I was so proud of you for being so brave and surrounding somebody that you didn't know. If God has helped you overcome an addiction to food, weed, porn, alcohol, you know, whatever, if God has helped you overcome an addiction in your life and you no longer struggle with it, raise your hand. Those of you that struggle with addiction, look around. I love our church. Let's, let's keep playing. If you were in a financial pickle, I mean a real, like, ouchie financially, and you prayed, and you sought God, and God did a money miracle for you. It cannot be denied God did a miracle. This is for Josie and I. Raise your hand. If you're in a money situation, look around right now. All right, put them down. If you have had a major relationship issue, we're talking marriage, maybe a sibling, uh, maybe uh, with your children, I mean an honest to goodness marriage trauma. Maybe you were sitting, we're the Reeves, maybe you were sitting at your lawyer's office with your divorce papers on the table. There's a couple in our church that that's their story. And you guys, at, at, for whatever reason in that relationship, you sought God to bring healing to a, a relationship. And God did a miracle, and you're still in good relationship with that person today. Raise your hand. Look around. Look around. Here's a fun one. <laughs> if you had a loved one, maybe a child or a, somebody you really loved in your family, and they, they knew God, and then they hardened their heart, and they ran away. Jesus calls them a prodigal, that they ran from God. But you prayed, and you sought God. And just like Jesus' story about the prodigal son, that prodigal came to themselves, and they realized that they need to return to the love of the Father. And they came running back to Jesus. They were forgiven of their sin, and they're back in right relationship with God. If you have prayed for and seen a prodigal return to the Father, shoot your hand up. If you have a, somebody in your life that needs to get right with God, look around. God did it for them. He'll do it for you. All right. If you were far from God, you had sin in your life, if you'd have got hit by a bus, you probably would have gone to hell. And God encountered you. And you saw your desperate need to surrender your life to Jesus, to ask God to forgive you. The Bible calls it repenting, where you change 180 degrees, you die to your old life, and you start living for Jesus. If you've ever gotten right with Jesus, would you shoot your hand up real high? <laughs> Some of you are like, well, I better raise my hand or I'm gonna look like that guy. That's all right, we're actually here for you right now. Put your hand down. If you're here this morning and you're not right with God, if you got hit by a bus, you're like, dude, I don't know that I'd go to heaven. But there's something your heart is pounding out of your chest right now. Maybe you're watching on YouTube right now and tears are streaming down your face. I, I can kind of feel you right now. You've been struggling. You've been struggling with an addiction to oxy. And I don't know why you're watching church today and you don't know why you're watching church today. But your heart is beating out of your chest and there's tears running down your face. And I just said what I said about getting right with God. Today is your day to get right with God. But here's the deal, you've got to send us an email so we know we can begin to pray for you and encourage you in your walk with God. If you're like, I, I can feel it so strongly, if you're like my friend who's watching online or you're here in the room this morning and you would just be honest and say, I'm not right with God, but I want to get right with God. I, I, I haven't repented of my sin. Or maybe you're like that prodigal, you're far from God. 
but there's something beating in your heart right now that says, I have to return to the love of the Father in heaven. You want to repent of your sin and make Jesus the Lord of your life, either for the first time or the first time in a long time. I would love to pray for you, pray with you. I I can't pray it for you. I can only lead you. But if that's you this morning, would you be brave and shoot your hand up real high and say, preacher, pray for me. Today's my day to get right with God. I see your hand. Is there anybody else? 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 All right. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> what about you at home? There's five people that raised their hand. Big, brave. Do you know that most churches, you're like, all right, close your eyes, bow your head. Let's get real serious. No, no, no. I, head up, eyes open. If you want to get right with Jesus, and five people said, I want to get right with God. Right there in your living room, I want you to shoot your hand up because God can see you. Now, even if you were too chicken to, to raise your hand, that's okay. God loves saving chickens too. Let's all pray this together. Remember, I can't pray it for you. You have to believe it in your heart and pray it out loud. All of us, let's pray together. Say, dear Jesus, please forgive me of my sin. I repent and I surrender my life to you. I die to my old self so I can live for you. I receive the gift of eternal life. I receive the gift of adoption into your family. I'm no longer an orphan. I'm a child of the Most High God. I'm no longer a sinner. I'm a saint in the kingdom of God. Thank you, Lord, for your love for me. I love you. I worship you. I honor you. In Jesus' name, say amen. I'm so proud of you. 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 you. Come on, somebody. Yay, God. Yay, God. Yay, God. (laughs) 